Welcome everyone to this uh, another episode of Talks at Google. We're very honored to have two fantastic speakers here today. I want to start with Marianne, Marianne Ken Stoll. She is the president and founder of the Kari Mule International Help Foundation. She is also the assistant head of the Ideal World Arts Academy in the States. She has been an educator for more than 30 years and she's a mother of four. So welcome here at the Google office. And then I have the pleasure to actually announce my old boss, uh, who used to be a VP of, at Google and at IBM. And he has a long, uh, fantastic career in the IT space, in the, in the tech space. Uh, he comes back today in a different function. So he has uh, since left Google and has made a career as an advisor, um, as a member of, I think, six boards. Um, but he also has, and he always had that even back at Google, uh, he was very involved with NGOs. Um, this is one of them, so we're gonna be very excited, very excited about the talk and, and the story here. He's an avid world traveler, um, I know this firsthand. He's visited more than 50% of all countries, and, and he's also a very family-oriented person. So she's a role model for, for many Googlers here, so welcome back at Google, uh, Nelson. Please both take it away from here. Thank you everyone for inviting me here. It's really my honor to be here. Um, as Raphael said, I'm the founder of Karimu and I work at an arts boarding school and my passion is for Karimu Foundation which my husband and I founded in 2007 and I'm thrilled that Nelson is now part of the Karimu team and invited me here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marianne. I'm gonna skip the uh a little bit of my background. You already had heard enough from Raphael. Um, let me get right into the topic of the presentation, which is to give you a sense of what is wrong with existing NGOs and what is an approach that I believe is successful to do social development. Uh, as some of you know, about one third of the world's population continues to live in poverty, which is about people that earn less than two dollars a day. Um, from these uh, 2.4 million, a billion people, 70% um, of them live in rural areas, with the large majority being in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, obviously, these folks live in these situations. Uh, some of you have seen these pictures when I was here two years ago. All of the, these pictures, including all the pictures that you're going to see in this presentation, are pictures that either I took in my world travels or that Marianne and her volunteers took from the work in Tanzania. So you have um, lack of, of uh, sanitation. You, know, you can see what this kid is doing. The other one down the river is drinking the water. Um, this is a typical house in the interior of sub-Saharan Africa or here is another one, or this is a typical village in some places. Um, you also have issues with transportation. This is a, this is a fancy transportation in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa with people even on the top, or something like this. Um, this is a feeding station in Somalia. Um, this girl has four and a half uh, years old. Um, and this is the whole hospital where there is no nurses, the mothers or grandmothers that take the kids there to get fed so they don't starve, uh, basically have to take care of them. So this is the situation that a lot of actually, a lot of and a lot of people live uh, uh, even as, as of today. Um, when you look at what are all the big issues, the big challenges that the poor faces, you could actually categorize the challenges in three classes, in three categories. And in order to, for you to really take people out of poverty, you have to address these three issues. The first one, given that the majority of them are in, uh, living from agriculture, they live in the, in the interior of these countries, um, it's super important to increase their productivity, increase their income. Uh, most of them have very small pieces of land. Uh, they don't have money to buy fertilizers and pesticides, etc. so their production is very small and consequently their profit is also very small. On top of that, they are dependent on a middleman that comes to the village to buy their goods and go sell into a, in a larger market. 
and that middleman is in most cases basically um, getting the biggest profits because they know how to handle. The second major category is health. Uh, you have the issue of some of these folks not having access to good health services um, or not having the money to pay for health services um, uh, or if, if, they have, if they have an emergency they may not even have the means to pay for, a, for somebody to drive or take them uh, into, uh, into a hospital. And the third issue is related to access to financial services, right? In our society, if you need money, you actually will take a loan. Uh, we all have credit history and it's uh, easy for us to get to, to, uh, to, uh, to money. Um, however, for all of these guys that live in the countryside, there is no banking system available for them. They don't have credit history. And so if an emergency t happens, and they don't have means to borrow money or get from somebody else, they basically need to sell the little things that they have. They may need to sell the cow that feeds and provides milk to the kids in the family. And now they basically go deeper and deeper into this hole. Um, and as you can see, all of these issues are interconnected, right? If I don't have access to financial systems, I cannot take a loan at the beginning of my agriculture uh, phase and buy the necessary fertilizer and pesticides to increase my productivity. Similarly, if I don't have this and now I have a family emergency, um, I, I have to sell things that are super important for me to be able to survive. I have seen people selling the seeds in order to pay for the visit to a doctor. Well, and now you don't have seeds, how do you produce your income? I get asked this question quite often and that's why I decided to put explicitly on the slides. Education is not a challenge. The lack of education is really, a, or education is really a means to address some of these issues, in particular, how to improve your income and how to become healthier. Uh, so while a lot of NGOs, and including the work that Karimu does, does focus on education, it's really not the challenge itself. The challenges, the three biggest challenges you really need to focus on is income, health, and access to, uh, to financial systems. So, um, as I have, um, as some of you know that know a little bit of my history, I have been involved in NGOs for over 10 years uh, in, different, in different ways. I'm in the board of, of some of them, I advise other NGOs, and I work as volunteers as well. And while I think it's wonderful, the work that they do, and it's super gratifying to see the positive impact of a project, sometimes it's really aggravating when you see failures happening on the ground. Um, and these failures um, are related to a few problems that are highly connected with the way NGOs have been operating until very recently. The first major problem, and that requires a little bit of explaining, uh, is to, is, has to do with the fact that there is a vacuum between NGOs that do the execution on the ground and the big donors. So in, in the past, you, you usually would have kind of two types of NGOs. Those that are small, doing execution on a specific country. Uh, they only focus on a specific region uh, or they focus on a specific topic. Somebody builds schools, somebody builds bridges, somebody uh, does hospitals, somebody helps with vaccination. Uh, and then you had middleman NGOs, so larger NGOs that don't do the execution, but they build comprehensive projects that together brings many NGOs together to address all those three issues. And somebody will focus on, on uh, health, somebody will help income, somebody will do financial services. The NGOs define a comprehensive project for all of them and then work in executing these projects across the globe with different NGOs that are physically represented in, in the different countries. Unfortunately, these middleman NGOs, and Grameen Foundation is a good example of those, are dying. And the main reason is because technology has enabled the donors to communicate directly with the small NGOs on the ground. And obviously they also want to make sure that every penny that they donate goes directly to the impact of the projects. And for them, these middleman NGOs are almost like a tax in, on, on, the, on, the, on the project itself. That has created a vacuum because even when you do manage to create a solution, beautiful in some country, there is nobody now to generalize that solution and replicate across the globe. And what we are starting to see is lots of one-offs. 
So either you see a solution that works here and there is nobody else to replicate and bring it to a different country, um, or you have the issue of, yes, I solved the education problem in some place or the financial systems problem in some place, but there is nobody else active in this region to deal with health or to deal with the income issue. And so consequences of this problem is you are starting to see lots and lots of one-off solutions that are obviously successful, but they are not scalable or sustainable to really address the problem worldwide. Uh, or you have as point solutions that are really not addressing all the three challenges that I described before. The second problem is that the smaller NGOs do not have the time to spend the interacting with the community and ensuring that they understand the peculiarities of their culture uh, and also obtaining their buy-in to different projects. The donors give them money, they want the results as soon as possible, they don't give any money that is not directly related to the project, and consequently these guys come in, they want to execute and they want to move out. And obviously if you don't interact with the community, if you don't involve them, if you don't get their buy-in, the consequence is, yeah, you may get fantastic short-term results, but the NGO leaves and then everything falls apart. So mid-term mid to long-term, the value is gone. The positive impact disappears. Uh, or if the long-term impact remains, usually it happens because now there is a dependence on the presence of that NGO on the ground. So as long as the NGO is there supporting, leading, driving the project, then it, you continue to see the impact, but the moment they leave, it will fall apart. So you create a dependency, and this is really bad because with, if you create dependency, you really don't have a, a sustainable solution. Similar to the previous one, the smaller NGOs don't have time to really work with the community so that they have skin in the game, so that they own the project. So they come in, usually they bring people from the outside, execute the project, and they move out. And so the community is not involved, doesn't understand the project, does, know how, does not know how to drive it, how to continue to execute, and then you have similar issues. Um, lack of sustainability, once the project is completed, the NGO is disconnected because you really did not get the community to feel that this is their project, it is their responsibility to maintain, um, you, don't, you don't sustain it. Uh, or, similar to the previous point, you do have positive impact long term, but now it's because of the NGO is, is there and you create a dependency. Um, and similar to the previous one, they also don't have the time and the money to obtain trust from the community. And this is particularly important when you want to change people's behavior. Right? If somebody for, the, for their whole life has been working or, or, or reacting in a certain way, and you want to change the way these people operate or behave, in order for you to, come, to help them change, they really need to trust you. They really need to believe you know better, they really need to know you have good intentions, etc., etc. And to build trust and strong relationships with people take time. And that investment is not funded by the donors because it's not dollar that goes directly into a project. Consequently, you see the donors come in, but not, as you see in this picture, is spending enough time with the community to gain their trust and you have exactly the same points, right? You may get positive results, short term, but not long term. Uh, or if you do see long term positive results, it's because you have created a dependency on the NGO. So um, summarizing, the problems are the, the vacuum that exists uh, in terms of replicating the solutions because the middleman NGOs have disappeared. And the fact that the smaller NGOs are under the gun to show results and they don't have the time to understand the peculiarities and the culture of the, of the community, gain their buy-in, make sure that they feel ownership of the projects and really trust you. And the consequences, as I had mentioned, you end up with solutions that don't address all three key challenges. So you may fix health issues, but you didn't address the other ones, so people remain poor. Uh, or you do fix the income issue, but they still don't have enough a good health. Um, obviously, lack of scalable and sustainable solutions, uh, the dependency on the NGOs, 
for, for, to maintain long-term results or um, the, um, the, the, uh, the uh, lack of long-term results because the angels disappear, there is no ownership from the community. So I have been, even though I love the work of NGOs, I have been quite frustrated for a long time with exactly that. And so my wife and I were seriously considering creating our own NGO so that we actually don't make those mistakes. Um, we probably would make other mistakes, like when nobody's perfect, but at least we would not do those. Um, and um, talking to different people that ran NGOs, and in particular talking to an organization called Inspire World that does uh, organize volunteer trips to Africa and Asia. They introduced me to Karimu, and um, by talking to Marianne, um, I, she convinced me to go last year to Africa as part of the volunteer team. Um, and when I saw, when I went there, my wife and I, and we, we saw the way they operated, I was amazed to see that none of these problems existed with the way Karimu operated. Um, and that's how the partnership started. But before I get into that, let me let Marianne talk, give you a little bit of the history of Karimu. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. I did not anticipate that Nelson would be so taken by the village that he would want to join us and continue to go to the village because I knew that he had been involved with so many NGOs. I thought, why would he want to be involved with us? We are, we are relatively small. My husband and I have full-time jobs and we only go to this village two weeks out of every year, but we have been going there for 10 years. And you will be hearing throughout my talk kind of a mantra over and over that without trust, without relationship, and without learning from the people, nothing can happen. You know, how many of you, you've probably heard this saying before, if you give a man a fish for a day, he, he'll eat for a day. Um, if, you give him, if you teach a man how to fish, then he can eat for life. Well, I've kind of added on to this, which is I truly believe after spending 10 years with the people of Dorada, many of them already know how to fish. They don't need to learn how to fish. They just need the resources. And the model that we ended up doing was not something specifically that we masterminded. We just were dropped in this village on vacation and realized that we had to do something. So I'm gonna backtrack a little bit and tell you the story of what happened. We were tourists in Tanzania in 2007 and we did a cultural stay in the village of Dorada. We lived with 11 children and in a kind of a brick hut kind of structure with no electricity and no running water. And before we arrived on this cultural stay, I kept getting emails from our cultural tour operator who is now our director and guy on the ground in Tanzania saying, do you wanna participate in a school project? And we were saying, yeah, that sounds great. So we were envisioning that there would be an NGO in this village and that Don and I would happily come and shovel some dirt and give a couple hundred dollars and be on our way. But when we arrived at the school, and saw the deplorable condition of the classrooms. There was no windows, no doors, 200 students at this school, only two usable classrooms. So that means all different age levels in, in a classroom, right? There were two other classrooms that had walls, but no roof because the government says to the villagers, if you build the walls, we will provide the roof. Well, they'd been waiting for years for the roof, and so the walls were already starting to crumble. The worst of it is, the worst of it was, was the toilet. There was a shallow hole in the ground, literally not even a cement pit latrine or anything like that, just like it looked like somebody had taken a shovel and dug a big hole in it and put sticks and some burlap sacks around it. And this hole in the ground was supposed to serve 200 people. The government was going to close the school because even by rural African standards, it was not sanitary. So I looked across the yard and I saw this half-built latrine. There were, it looked like the possibility of maybe having six latrines. And I said, well, what's going on there? And they said, well, we, the villagers started making it years ago, but they've ran out of money. And I said, well, how much money do you need? They said, $500. And my husband and I looked at each other and we thought, well, 
this is a no-brainer. We can give them $500 to fix the latrine and then you know the school will stay open. So we only had $200 in our pocket because we were very naive. We thought we could cash traveler's checks in rural <laughs> Tanzania and it turned out that we were just like, okay, we, all we have is $200 here, but will this do and we'll wire you money when we get home? And they were just singing and dancing. You'd think this was the greatest thing that ever happened. The toilet, the toilet was mentioned in every, I couldn't understand Swahili, but the toilet was mentioned in every song that they made up. And then, so we were getting ready to leave and my husband tends to be very direct because he doesn't like to get people's hopes up. And he said to the head teacher, Paul Uranimo, Paul, we have enjoyed our stay, but we are teachers and we have to go back to work and we're probably not gonna come to this village again because this was the trip of a lifetime that we'd been saving for. But we will do fundraisers at school and we'll send the money back to you. Well, Paul looked at my husband with these big brown liquid eyes, grabbed his arm and said, Mr. Don, we need your money, but you are part of our family now and you must come back. And so, of course, he tugged at our heartstrings and we went home and started uh, creating a nonprofit called Karimu. When I look back at that moment with Paul, I think that was our guiding light from the very beginning because Paul, along with the other teachers, could have easily taken advantage of Don and me. We were naive, we had not done any development work. He could have said, sure, send the money. And this happens so often in Africa where money gets absconded with and then the projects don't get done. We could have been easily taken in. But what he wanted was an ongoing relationship with us. He didn't want just the money. And just this past mm, week or so ago, when we were in the village, I was talking to our longtime friend, Mr. Kaaya, who's also the assistant project manager, and I asked him about this first visit, and I said, why were you so insistent that we return? And he, he's very adamant and very strong, and he said, if you are not friends and you just bring money, if there is no relationship, you throw money in the pit. We don't want that. We don't want that. And so we went back, as I said, and we started the nonprofit. And also being in education, we were able to recruit 28 volunteers. So in the summer of 2008, we arrived at this Ufani school and started building the first four classrooms. And it was there that we learned the importance of working side by side, of working with the villagers, getting our hands dirty, partnering on the construction. And not only that, I, I was overwhelmed with the amount of people that wanted to meet with Don and me. We, we met with the village council, we met with doctors, nurses, school leaders. We were invited to sit in huts and have meals, long, walk the long red dirt roads and wherever you walk, I mean, Nelson knows this, wherever you walk, there's a meeting going on because if you have to go to one school to the next, there's five people that say, can I talk to you, can I talk to you? But it was through this putting time into the relationship and learning from them what their life was like. Don and I have been coming there for 10 years. I could go there for 20 years and not really understand the struggles that these people have in their daily lives. So who am I or anybody else to come in here and say, here's a, here's a solution to your problem when you don't even live there and have to deal with the struggles that they have? So we continued doing this volunteer work every summer and over the period of five years, ta-da, this is Ufani School. Now, after many years, there are 10 classrooms, two teachers' offices, three teachers' houses, 12 pit latrines, and then through going slow on this project and not feeling like we have to, as they say in Swahili, haraka, haraka, hurry, 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 not doing that, we developed a really strong relationship with the teachers and a friendship with them. And then we started supporting professional development. Then we started buying books. Then we started hearing about their daily challenges. We started hearing that some of the teachers couldn't get to school because the, their bridge, there was a little footbridge, was washed out. So they needed a bridge. So we said, okay, well, I guess we better find a way to do that. So we partnered with an NGO in Kenya called Bridging the Gap Africa and built a suspension walking bridge. And 
what people might think is, wow, this is a small NGO and it sounds like Marianne and Dawn are all over the map. You know, why don't they just focus on one thing? But again, if we go back to, we ask the villagers to come up with a list of needs, we look at their priorities, and then we also think about the children going to that school. If we only had focused on the renovation of this school, the attendance would not have increased by 250%. And we also would not be able to boast of the fact that Ufani School now is usually goes between one and fourth out of 150 schools. It is number one school in terms of school environment in a rural area, and also they're competing with other schools in the city. So, you know, if we had said, let's just do the classrooms, we wouldn't have had the buy-in from the teachers. We wouldn't have had the parents who we got to know and who started wanting their kids to come to the school. So what we realized is this holistic approach was all we could do. And little by little by little, we are trying to lift the community and create a sustainable, empowering model for the people that live there. So let me step back and give you a little bit of a sense of how Karimu operates, right? There are three principles that defines the model of Karimu. The first one Marianne already pointed to is the belief that we as outsiders don't really understand as deep as, as we would have to, what are the needs of the villagers and also what would be the best solution for those challenges. Um, and, there, and you will see actually some examples of that. The second is that all projects that Karimu does are selected together with the village. The village councils, midwives, the leaders in the community, uh, key influencers, etc. And so by doing that, you are getting their buy-in from the beginning. Third, or as part of that, they also have to be involved in the projects. They have to get their hands dirty, they have to work on it. And third is obviously we focus on projects and designing the projects in such a way that they are actually self-sustained once completed. Um, these uh, three principles are implemented in, in basically three different ways, three different points. The first one is all the ideas, all the requests comes from everyone. So if I like the Google Moto, Moto bottoms up, um, all of that gets collected and then jointly with in, uh, the village councils the structure in the community in Tanzania is, that, is such that every village has a village council. The village council is basically members from the different families that represent those families and there is a leader of that. So anything that the village council decides gets the buy-in of all the families and so consequently you have the whole community behind it. So the priorities are decided with them and then Karimu requires the community to have three major tasks. The first one is they need to get the co commitment from the government. If we're gonna build a school, the government has to commit to pay for the teachers, to maintain the school afterwards, provide school material, etc. The local community has to pay approximately 10% of the total cost of the construction. This is a lot of money. The bunch of school that we are building this year is going to cost at $90,000. $9,000 for the couple hundred families that are there, it is a lot of money. A lot, lots, lots of money. To have you a sense, we visited a school uh, this year and the community decided to build, to build toilets for this school. So they are collecting $7 per family. There are 535 families in this village. So $7 per family. When I talk to the head of the village council, he says, how many of these families are going to pay? He says, oh, I believe that about 300 families can pay the $7 right away. And I ask him, what about the other 200? He says, well, from the other 200, there is about 100 that I'm just gonna have to go there and nag and nag and nag, and at some point they will pay the, others, the $7. What about the remaining 100? He says, they're gonna run away. They're gonna move out of the village because they don't have enough money to pay for $7. So now you can imagine $9,000 is really a lot of money, which basically means they really need to want this, right? And so you get their commitment, you get their involvement from day one, and they will treat these projects as a jewel, right? As they will take care, they will make sure that this never uh, disappears. 
Um, they also need to work on the project, so they need to get their hands dirty. In general, for constructions, the community, because of the time of the year that we start the constructions, they usually start the project. They clean the land and they do all the foundations on their own. After that, we give the money to hire workers that will do the rest, and then the volunteers will come and do work on some phase of the project. And once the projects are completed, it's their job to maintain and run. You go to funny schools, you will see parents cleaning the corridors and washing the, the floor of the classrooms. Uh, you will see kids and teachers working in the field um, of the school. So it's really, they, they really have a, a strong ownership. So let me give you some examples of these principles uh, with, uh, with existing projects. Well, as I said before, there were issues and there were barriers that I did not even know existed. And one of them was teachers' housing. So once we renovated the classrooms and we started going from school to school renovating classrooms, the teachers had us meet with them and said, we are not going to be able to attract teachers unless they have adequate housing. The government had agreed that they would give more teachers to these overcrowded schools. I mean, they're really overcrowded. For example, the kindergartens are only supposed to have 20 students in there. There's 60 in each kindergarten session. In the fifth grade, there are 75 students in a class in one of the, um, one of the stu uh, schools that I visited. So then we thought, OK, well, we, again, we got the village buy-in. And this was what a teacher was living in. Now, if you are living in Arusha or Dar es Salaam, you're a university-educated person, do you think you want to come and live in a mud hut? It would be like one of you saying, oh, yeah, I'll go to Switzerland. Oh, here's a trailer for you to live in, right? And you wouldn't want to do that. So we honored their professionalism by renovating the teachers' houses. At um, Ayalagaya Secondary School, there are three two-in-ones. So that means a family can live here and a family can live there. And again, they had to come and help build that house. And the other thing that we learned about, this is a very interesting project. In 2009, we did a survey and we discovered that actually the number one killer in that village area was respiratory disease for adults, not malaria. That's generally children that have that issue, but respiratory disease. And the reason is, is that the villagers are cooking over open fires or they're often cooking in shacks like this where they're breathing in the smoke. And when we got the results of that survey, um, we asked them what's going on here and they said well if we had a kitchen with fuel efficient stoves they're like big aluminum cylinders and you can put in a quarter of amount of the wood that you would for an open fire and they're not breathing that smoke and also you can cook more food with these fuel efficient cylinders so the children can not only have lunch but they can also have breakfast and what I didn't realize is just by doing this fuel efficient stove, it could not only provide more food for the students, more, less firewood, which means they're buying less firewood and that money can go towards buying books and pencils and repairing classrooms. And then also the health of the cooks would be greatly improved. It broke my husband's heart every year when he would see Faustino and Peter, the same cooks that had been there for 10 years, cooking in a black shack with their eyes red and coughing. The other thing that we came to realize that in the village already, there was a woman named Tumaini who was building these small fuel efficient stoves, not really because she was thinking about respiratory disease, but because this is an efficient way if you're boiling a pot of beans just to have some coals or a little bit of wood, and then you don't have to start a big fire. But she was running this stove operation where the profits were going to her women's group, but also a small percentage was going to the orphans. And then she is also training students that may not be able to go to secondary school because that's incredibly difficult um, for students sometimes who are very poor not to be able to get to school often and they have to stay home. So she's training them to make these stoves so that they can have a profession. 
So as you see, what was great about this project that took a few years because it took a while, as Nelson was saying, to change that behavior. Uh, Peter and Faustina, Faustino, they were in that black shack and, they, and I said, why aren't you cooking in the kitchen? And they said, well, we do the tea in the black shack. And I said, no, 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 we'll get you a smaller stove. We, we know, you know you have those big ones, we'll give you a little one so you can do the tea. So while we were changing that behavior and working on the kitchen, we also were supporting this more comprehensive project which the two are coming together. So not only were we learning to see the situation in a more broad, comprehensive way, but um, Tumaini now is helping the village and the school students. So I love the interconnectivity. The other thing about the school is that the schools don't receive any government funding, or what they do is so small, as the head of uh, Isla Gaia said, it's a joke. Um, it's something like, you know, $5 a month to maintain the school and all the repairs and everything. And so the teachers have to find a way to maintain the school on their own and do their own repairs. So what they told us is that if we build a water irrigation, this is not, you know, when people think of Africa, they think it's very arid and dry, but this area actually has a lot of water this particular school area, not all areas, but they had too much water, so they needed an irrigation channel to be able to redirect that. That's something that Don and I would not have thought of, and for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the cost of $1,500, this enabled the school to start producing crops, which then would mean that it would provide school lunches, which then means they could sell the crops and then buy their school supplies. So for me and Dawn and for Nelson and anybody else who joins this, I feel like I'm learning things all the time. I think it's very exciting to learn how resilient these people are and the solutions that they come up with. So as, as, as you could see, in terms of, it's super important to work together with the community. You, almost nobody would come up with the idea of building an irrigation system to a school. Right? So as, unless you are spending enough time there and listening to the locals, you will come up with ideas that actually don't work. Similarly, you come in and say, oh, I'm going to rebuild the school. You will never think that unless you have reasonable teachers' houses, you're not going to attract good teachers. Um, and if you don't attract good teachers, okay, you have a nice building, but the quality of the studies remain extremely bad. Um, and, uh, and similarly, as Marianne talked about is it's super important for you to spend enough time and build the trust so that you can force them to change behavior. All of us actually that don't cook in open fire probably think it's stupid to be cooking open fire and, and, and burn your eyes. But many of you have grandparents and probably you're never going to convince them to use a microwave because they have learned to cook on a stove for their whole life. Why would they use a microwave? Similarly, these people have, have cooked in open fire their whole lives. They have never seen a stove, right? So how do you convince them? How do you get them to change the way they operate? So that takes time, and it's a lot of hand-holding that you have to do. Um, and unless you spend enough time and build that strong trust, you really don't accomplish that. So, Obviously, Karimu has done many, many more projects than this. So let me very quickly run through some examples. Uh, since 2008 to 2015, they built a renovator uh, for uh, different schools. Um, the enrollment has increased by more than 200%, 250%. So that gives you a sense of the number of students that were not attending school because the parents felt it's not worth it, right? This building is falling apart, there is no food, the quality of the teacher is pretty bad, so why should I waste my time? This kid can help me my bill, uh, increase my, my, uh, my income through producing more crops. Uh, here are some of the examples of the schools. This is not, this is very typical, and we have seen two more schools this year that are exactly in this situation. This is a classroom. Um, uh, in addition to that, they have built a gazillion of school toilets from something like this to something like this. Um, there has been, as Marianne said, um, uh, uh, kitchens built in several schools. Um, we have seen as a consequence of that, 
the performance of the students improve dramatically? Obviously, these guys come to school without having eaten anything. So the fact that the school provides breakfast and lunch, they now have, can pay attention to what is being said in the classroom. Attendance significantly higher because there is high motivation for the parents to send the kids to school. And obviously with that, the enrollment also has been increased significantly. Um, teachers housing, huge impact from an in average teachers in that region would spend two, maximum three years in the school and obviously run away. Now the average is going up to 10 years because they have nice houses, the environment is great, they don't want to leave. And obviously the best teachers then uh, end up remaining. What is most impressive is in Tanzania, kids on their fourth grade and seventh grade has to do a national, has to take a national exam. If you don't pass, you cannot progress in your study. So if you don't pass in the fourth grade, you cannot go to fifth grade. If you don't pass in the seventh grade, you will not go into secondary school. Um, before the houses were built, uh, the schools in this area, the, the success rate in this exam was below 50%. It's now above 85%. And the school that we rebuilt this year is 95%. This is really impressive for a rural, for a rural school. And this is, this is a teacher. This is what his house used to be. And now he lives in this house. Right? So now you can imagine that this guy is highly motivated to stay in this area uh, and, uh, and help improve the school. Uh, they have done lots of projects uh, uh, around education, providing textbooks, sending volunteers to teach at schools. I gave some classes last year. Um, they have also funded further development for the teachers. Um, they pay 75% of the costs. The teachers have to pay 25% uh, on their own. And obviously, this has not only helped the reputation of the teachers, but also increased the performance of the school. Uh, several projects around bling, bringing clean water into the villages as well as into schools. This is very typical, what you see. Um, this year, we visit a village, very, very poor, dry. There are, there are places where the kids and the families can get water. The closest from the village is two kilometers going downhill. I saw an eight-year-old girl with her, her five-year-old brother carrying a bucket of this size in her hand. I asked her how often she does that. And she very casually said, oh, I do three times in the morning, four times during the, the day, and two times in the evening. So walking that distance with this water means this girl has no way of going to school. Um, what is also interesting is the moment you bring clean water into the school, the absence rate gets reduced dramatically because obviously kids are not drinking uh, unsanitary water. And, and consequently, they are not as sick as they are before. Um, the clean stoves that uh, Marianne already talked about, uh, lots of infrastructure projects. Uh, this bridge was particularly important. In the rainy season, this river floods. And so instead of taking two hours for people to walk to school, it, with the bridge takes 15 minutes. Uh, it, the, accepted, the attendance rate in the rainy season went up from 35% to 91%. So imagine during three months of the year, you have the attendance at 35%, these kids cannot catch up. Uh, in addition to that, there is traffic of goods that goes to this bridge. And if the river is flooded, the families that have harvest during that time of the year, they cannot sell, uh, right? Or they have to pay somebody to go around the, the, the river. Um, help with the uh, creating a room for uh, people to give birth, bring a solar panel uh, for that. Many projects around health um, in terms of trying to reduce the mortality uh, rate uh, in the region. Uh, also, uh, education in general about hygiene and sanitation and, and diseases that are easy to avoid, like diarrhea, et cetera. Um, also, distribution of, uh, of donations and material. Uh, another very important project in the financial area was the support for creation of savings groups. Savings groups are self-organized organizations, as you can see here, a meeting with different villagers, uh, where they meet on a regular basis. Everybody contributes a certain amount 
that becomes a pot that people then can use to borrow money. And so if I need to buy fertilizer or somebody got sick, right, that will be my bank. I can go to that and I will then obtain the loan. And by doing that, the families basically are helping each other address the financial needs. This is actually quite common uh, in, the developing, in the developing world. What is interesting, right, just to see this, the fact that they now have access to finance, the members of this community that have been there for three years triple their income uh, because of the access to, uh, to financial means. Uh, last year that um, I joined as a volunteer, uh, in addition to education and training for the midwives, we built a maternity clinic. This is extremely important because mortality rate in these parts of the world are very high. Uh, infant mortality is seven times higher than in the US and mat maternal mortality is 28 times higher than the US. So by now having this maternity clinic, 39,000 people are being served and women can come here to give uh, birth. Uh, and this is the maternity clinic today. We just saw it operating with the, as with a little hospital, people, uh, kids taking uh, vaccination. Uh, there is doctors and nurses there. Um, this year, we had 27 volunteers that went with us. We had several projects running in parallel. Um, a teacher from California organized uh, classes in all schools for art, science, and interactive uh, learning with different subjects. Um, a family from California that owns a solar uh, panel company um, came and actually installed solar panels in all schools and in the maternity clinic. So the maternity clinic now is fully equipped, can run the equipments that are necessary, etc. My brother, who is a sports freak, organized a sports competition with 120 kids. Uh, this was a huge success. We taught IT uh, to all the teachers, taught them uh, Google Docs, registered everybody on Gmail, uh, also on Facebook. So now we can continue remotely bring new information and new educational material for them. And we set up a learning center in the secondary school that all the teachers will be able to access and use. Uh, the biggest project was the uh, reconstruction of the Bacho Primary School. This is how the school looked before. Uh, this is a classroom with no electricity. How can you actually even see what the teacher is writing uh, on, the, on the blackboard? And this is the a third of the school, the school has been built in three buildings. There are three buildings. The first one is just completed. We as volunteers finished this. By, we had just to do the painting. Um, and these are three classrooms and the teacher's uh, office. And, um, and the rest, we worked on the second building. We set the foundations as well as the walls. Um, so in summary, as I had mentioned, the traditional development uh, is having a lot of challenges because the way they used to operate with middlemen NGOs that allowed them to spend enough time and create comprehensive solutions are dying out. And consequently, you are not being able to have the impact that you used to have with nonprofits. Um, Karimu avoids that by, as I said, believing that the villages really understand their problems and working with them, forcing them to not only develop, define the projects, but having a skin in the game in contributing to the projects, working on them, maintaining them, getting the government support, uh, and ensuring that the projects are self-sustainable. Um, moving forward, um, uh, now that I join forces with uh, Mary Ann, we are going to really be expanding. You guys, those of you that know me, uh, I tend to do multiple things in parallel. So we're going to be running multiple large projects uh, at the same time. Uh, we uh, have just hired another person that is going to be on the ground so that we can execute these projects throughout the year. Um, we are going to be also expanding beyond the district that we are currently operating. When we were there, we met with the head of the region. It's like the state uh, in Tanzania. They are super committed in support to us. They were super impressed with the projects. And he's, they are going to help, the government is going to help us give us the priority of what should be the next districts for us to operate. And we are 
in parallel building like a three to five year strategic plan after we do a complete assessment of the area, identifying what are the places, all the places needing water, what are all, all the schools that need bathrooms, what are all the schools that need teachers housing, etc., so that we can comprehensively start addressing all these problems at the same time. And I already mentioned the support from the government. Um, let me skip the, the projects for next year. Um, and um, in addition to finishing the school, we are going to be focusing heavily on bringing clean water to two villages that have no water. I told you the story about the girl and also the schools on these villages trying to recreate, uh, rebuild them. There is many opportunities for you guys to get involved. I hope I have touched the hearts of some of you. Um, if you would like to experience um, what it is to do some really hands-on volunteer work, join us. We go to Africa, to Tanzania every year uh, between mid-June to early July. Uh, and you're going to work side by side with the villagers. It's, it's going to be a wonderful cultural experience. Um, if you feel insecure, don't worry about it. We use an organization I had mentioned before, Inspire Worldwide. They are specialized in organizing volunteer tours for Africa and Asia. They handle your safety, transportation, all the logistics, where we stay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you have any questions, you can ping me or you can send an email directly to Karimu Foundation. Obviously, if you don't feel like joining as a volunteer, help us, right? You can donate by going to www.karimufoundation.org. Um, and one thing I would like to emphasize is that every single penny you will donate is going to go to the projects. Dawn, Marianne, as well as the folks that she has on the ground work for free. And so, like me, we don't get a single penny. The volunteers that also go once a year, they pay all their expenses. So every dollar you donate are going to be used for the projects. Um, I want to use this opportunity to thank many, many Googlers that actually have contributed to the reconstruction of Bata School. I was really touched by the fact that we had 181 Googlers and ex-Googlers that came forward and actually helped us collect uh, enough money to really de reconstruct the school. Uh, and I hope people will continue to help us because there is a lot more to be done. Thank you very, very much. And I'd like to say thank you to all of you. You've been a wonderful audience. And I want to thank Nelson. As many of you know, he's a powerhouse. And I really admire that in him. But what I admire most of all is that Don and I welcomed him to this project. We're, we are pretty picky because we want people that are, have cultural sensitivity and that are really compassionate. Being smart is fantastic, but you've got to have the heart as well as the brain. And you also have to have patience and be willing to listen. And he's all of those things. So thank you very much. And thank you. This is wonderful being here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe, maybe I have time for one or two questions. Um, and since I know Nelson personally, I actually want to ask you a personal question, if I may. Um, you know, you look back to a very successful tech career. Um, you t retired from Google. You could be sitting on a sailing boat in the Caribbean and enjoy retirement. Maybe you do this. I do that too. Exactly. <laughs> I saw you on a couple of those pictures with really dirty hands, like literally dirty hands. What, how does that feel, and what does it give you personally? It's extremely difficult to describe what you feel when you are doing volunteer work, particularly hands-on volunteer work in this area. It is, all I can tell you is it, it's extremely gratifying, it's extremely satisfying. The eyes of the people, they're, the way they thank you, the way they, are, they show gratitude for what you do is so fulfilling, it's, it's impossible to walk away. Um, I came to Tanzania this year for the second time. So there was a lot of people that I have met. And it was an incredible feeling. The moment I was arriving in the village, I was, I was feeling like I'm back home, right? And people were coming to me, oh, and how's your son? And how's your wife? And, and what about this? And what about that? We, unfortunately, we in the developed countries have grown in a way that we have distanciated ourselves from, from our community. And they, 
they are extremely tight. And the moment you arrive there, you are part of their community. They are part of their family. Um, we tend to focus on us first, second, the family, third, the community. They are exactly the opposite. Community first, my family second, me as a person third. And it's incredible to see somebody making a decision that will that is not the best for them personally, but is the right thing to do for the community. We would never do that. When we arrived this year, and last year was the same thing, you, you get to the institute where we actually stay overnight, about 300 meters from the institute, there were probably 1,000 people waiting for you. And you get out of this bus, everybody's dancing, everybody's singing, welcoming you, and you are walking along this path there is the traditional dancers dancing their traditional things. You walk a little bit, there is the choir from the church, and then the choir from the school, and then the, the midwives, right, all thanking you and welcome you back home. So you really feel like you are the son that is coming back home for five to six years. It's, it's impossible. I, I don't want to talk some more because I, I will start crying. It's very telling. <laughs> exactly. I think it's very telling. That's exactly what I, why I asked. It sounds like it's very rewarding for you, and that's very impressive, and I think touches all of us. Thank you so much, Nelson. Maybe the final question to you, Marianne. Um, so from listening to all of this, it sounds like you sort of established maybe a best practice uh, in how to do this. That's how I understood what, you, what you're saying here. I wonder, in terms of vision and future, do you personally think you want to stay at that and you maybe want to grow just Carimo as it is today? Or, or would, you, would you even see potential maybe to, to roll out those best practices for other NGOs and maybe grow, in a sense, the, the method? I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, there's a company called Quantify in Santa Cruz that has been giving us a $20,000 matching grant every year, and they have endorsed this model, but the owner, Ken Terry, always says, you know, you should mentor other people because you could have replica, uh, replicated models, you know, in other villages. And it does take time because you have to stay in this same community, not creating dependency because you don't stay at one school, but you move from school to school, from, you know, medical center to other medical center. But you have to stay in that community so I would like to expand, but like this, and also I would like to be able to mentor other people. And this summer, we had the opportunity to mentor David Newman and his wife, Laura, who came and stayed some time in the village because they just started an NGO and they want to know how we do it. And they watched us for about five days and it was very, very gratifying to have them ask us questions, to walk with us through the village, so I'd like to continue replicating that model and with the idea, with small things, with concentrated work, you can do really, really great things. Let me add to what Marianne said. I think we have, I think Karimu has two goals, right? In addition to increase the impact in this region and slowly expand geographically, the second big role, and I think this is probably what would be the most powerful, is to create a new model for social development. Given that the existing model is falling apart, right, become a showcase of how you can be doing successful development work and hopefully have many, many other NGOs following exactly the same principle. Wonderful. Th thanks again so much for sharing this with us and the trust and everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.